Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Did Native Americans encounter alien travelers before they encountered us? Did the weird beings seen around Cape Ann, Massachusetts in 1692 contribute to the Salem witchcraft, witchcraft hysteria? Did UFO sightings inspire ancient petroglyphs? Well, hello, friends, and welcome to the 137th broadcast of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Paul, and those extremely interesting questions came from my co-host, partner in the paranormal, and son, Ben. Most excellent questions, but before we introduce the guy who came to answer them, let's do our weekly paranormal contest. Nobody got last week's question. In what U.S. state was a monster of this description seen by many people in the 1970s? Three legs, pink, two pink eyes as big as flashlights, and short arms on a four and a half foot tall and grayish colored being. Body. Well, body no, hey, you, know, you see that sort of thing every day. I think we got more gripes about how hard the question was than we did attempted answers. Now, come on. This is one of our favorite monsters. Have a little gumption. <coughs> what? <laughs> our producer says that we were describing his ex-wife. Well, uh, we're going to reword the question for this week. I'll let that pass. <coughs> okay, so in what town in Illinois was a monster seen of this description, seen by many people in the 1970s, three legs, two pink eyes, as big as flashlights, and short arms on a four and a half foot tall, grayish colored body? And a partridge in a pear tree. The secret word in there is Illinois. Okay, that's the state, so that should narrow it down a little bit. Sorry, man. All right, so call us locally at 401-766-1240 or nationally at 800-449-1240 or email us at eno at onworldwide.com. If nobody gets it before the end of the show and you still think you have a shot, drop a line to me at bennettbehindtheparanormal.com. Yeah, the winner gets a copy of Heaven's Wave, a novel of the Doomsday Prophecy of 2012. Now, he's on our CBS show tomorrow night, the author, Dierlon, but that show doesn't have a contest, so we're going to give it away today. And our guest today is Robert M. Stanley, formerly a corporate journalist for Honda Research and Development in Torrance, California. Robert is now the editor and webmaster of UnicusMagazine.com, the author of Close Encounters on Capitol Hill. I can't wait to read that. <laughs> and host of the Unicus Radio Hour. He has traveled to dozens of countries and has read hundreds of books and thousands of articles during his lifelong pursuit of modern and ancient mysteries. Over the past 30 years, Robert's quest for unique ideas and information has led him to research and write about many controversial topics. His ongoing investigations have been featured on international television and radio and in print. He is a native of Los Angeles. He grew up in Malibu before moving to southern New England, where he now lives with his wife, son, and dog. He enjoys surfing, motorcycle riding, tennis, photography, and composing music. And we're have a rare treat with having him as an in-studio guest today. That doesn't often happen because our guests from all over the universe, <laughs> literally. And uh, he lives uh, here in Rhode Island. So we're very happy to welcome him. All right, Robert Stanley, welcome to Behind the Paranormal. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Paul, for having me. It's a real pleasure. Oh, yeah. So, uh... First question. Yep. Is Von Donneken right? Were native peoples visited by UFOs in the days of yore? Um, that's what I've been told. I, I mean, i I got to preface everything by saying I apologize for anybody I'm going to offend now that is Native American because clearly they have a lot to be uh, concerned about as far as their reputation. But um, recently, having been here for a couple of years, I, I was introduced to a, a Native American uh, Poconoke. And he is a Osamegwan of the Poconoket, which I guess we would simply call a shaman. I think it goes a little deeper than that. But anyway, he the started... Poconoket being a New England tribe. Poconoket were the royal family that led the uh, government of the Wampanoag Nation for thousands of years prior to the Puritans showing up. At least that's what I was told. So, uh, yes, uh, not only here in New England, but out in the southwest, they, the native people speak about what they call star nation people coming down... Uh, from the heavens in things that, you know, we call them saucers, they call them bowls or baskets, whatever, or just star ships because they were glowing. And they would uh, interact and um, uh, sometimes even intermarry with these tribes of native people. Hmm. All right, so can you give us some examples from here in New England? Yeah, sightings or yeah, well, encounters by the natives? There's, uh, okay, 
unfortunately, because the natives carried an oral tradition, they didn't write anything down. So, uh, you know, I, I will tell you this much. As soon, almost as soon as the pilgrims showed up and were befriended by the Wampanoag and the Poconoket, they had a close encounter on Plymouth, uh, Plymouth Hill. And I believe, from what I was told, and this, this was told to me by the, uh, my Poconoket friend, that um, he had read this account, Governor Bradford's uh, proceedings, I guess, are c- contained in a building next to the Kennedy Library in Boston. But he said that um, it was the first spring. I guess the, li- the pilgrims landed in um, the, the winter of 1620. Yeah. So it was in the heat, he believes, if he recalls correctly, it was 1621 spring. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> the pilgrims apparently saw a, a cloud, a strange cloud-like object, come down and hover over the hill for hours. And they said what was so weird about it was that there was people inside the cloud that they could see this cloud, and that they were singing what in a language they couldn't understand, that the pilgrims could not identify, and that uh, it sounded like hymns to them. So, and obviously Governor Bradford thought that was pretty significant. Now, I know that the next encounter that's recorded by a governor of the uh, Boston colony was 1639. They saw a UFO, what we now call a UFO. They didn't know what to call it at the time. And then again, I think it happened in 1642 in Boston. So that's what we know of in modern times. From what I've been told by my uh, Poconoke friend is that the Poconoke themselves were a hybrid uh, of a, a group of very tall beings that came down uh, from the star system of Cirrus and that they intermarried which I think was really quite a feat considering that he claims that some of these people were originally almost 20 feet tall. Now, that may say complete, that sounds completely insane, but the legends like that and even remains like that have been found all over the world. So I had to pay attention to what he was saying. And he said over time there was multiple generations and that they started to diminish in size so that they became like anywhere from 8 to 12 feet tall, this hybrid. Now, you take the 20 feet tall and the, whatever the size the natives were, somehow they started genetically crossbreeding. And um, uh, there was, like I said, a, a compromise, uh, 8 to 12 foot tall. And this is what we were talking about off the air there. Uh, it was that... Uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow wrote about this skeleton and armor that was discovered in Fall River, Massachusetts, when they were digging a road. And uh, this individual was eight to nine feet tall, had a large shield of copper that was around his stomach and chest area. He also had um, 12 arrows that were copper-tipped. Now, those, those, that copper supposedly came from Newgate, Connecticut, and it, for a very ancient copper mine that predates the European arrival. So... Um, Hope I'm answering your question here about no no the, uh, no you are examples of uh, well you have know, the colonials and the <coughs> excuse me the natives uh, interacted for quite a few years there so yeah it's relevant by all means okay yeah. well but as far as the extraterrestrial aspect of it what they call the Star Nation people um, the Poconoke themselves are like I was describing a hybrid between or a cross genetic uh, breed between these extraterrestrial very tall extraterrestrials and the native people. And that at some point, the Poconoket became the uh, governing authority over the Wampanoag Nation. Not that they were lording over them or trying to control them. They just they had more understanding of how government or civilization should be run. And they institute a government uh, uh, based out of Wachusett Mountains. Uh, are because apparently something about the mountains that the UFOs like to go to or the spaceships like to be attracted to. There was three mountains in particular where contact usually occurred. That was Mount Hope. Mount Wachusett and Wanadnock. And, um, oh, Wanadnock in New Hampshire? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and all three of those, apparently, they had uh, communication systems. Even the, the natives had a, a way of, uh, they would go to the top of one, you could see the other and the other, and they would light fires. And But they also had, uh, the powwows were held uh, under the Star Sirius for a reason. is because that they were recognizing the uh, the fact that that was where they had originally come from. So yeah, this is really fascinating. Now, now this this may sound far out to people, mm-hmm. but th- there are uh, echoes of this story all over the world. Yes, you know we've done entire shows, uh, particularly about the Middle East and the whole Genesis story and mm-hmm. the contemporary documents from the Sumerians, etc. Which really is is this this entire scenario really on a larger scale? Yep. So this seems to be a pattern all over the planet. Right, but I, okay, so ha- having studied that on the West Coast and then coming here, I had a feeling that I would find it eventually. I was really surprised, though, when I was introduced to this this Osamaguan from the Poconoke 
family. And he started opening up and just, you know, downloading all this information to me. So he's very, you know, I, he's up there in years. And uh, he, I think part of the reason we met is I was giving him information, he was giving me information. And, and part of it is I'm supposed to, I think, preserve what he knows before he disappears and uh, and then preserve that and then pass it on to people that are interested because it is an important piece of the largest puzzle that you're just describing there. Well, you mentioned the star Sirius especially and uh, one thinks of the Dogon people of Africa, whose mm-hmm. name you reminded me of before the show, yep. uh, who believe that their ancestors came from the vicinity of the star Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky and right. not all that far away. Uh or right. It? It's it. Well, if you have the right technology, and see, this is a thing. If we go back to what you know, before I came to New England, I was studying, uh, uh, researching, investigating whatever uh, Washington D.C. and the paranormal events going on there. And um, <laughs> one of the things I found out was that there, we actually, my my journalism partner there in D.C. had taken a picture of a stargate or wormhole. Uh, Senate side of the Capitol in July of 2002, and clearly there was objects going in and out of this thing, and uh, Stargate, I guess you'd call it. And what's interesting about that is the Hopis, and, uh, the Hopi people out in the southwest, they claim that how they got here from the Pleiades star system was that they literally entered a hole in the sky. They followed one of their Kachina gods, mm-hmm. which is a humanoid, but you know they wear a mask because they, they don't want you to see their true identity, but they're basically human. And uh, he's the one that plays the flute. I think you call him Coca Pelli or something. Yeah, he's a very famous uh, art subject. Yeah, yeah, a lot of people stylized it, whatever. It's yeah. an iconic thing. But I'm just saying there, they claim there was an individual, this god-like person, who led them up a ladder into a hole in the sky, and they emerged here. So to, if that really did happen, I think they're, they're roughly describing a stargate or a wormhole which is something Stephen Hawking just recently said we should build. Um, on the one hand, he's saying we shouldn't talk to aliens because they might harm us. On the other hand, he's saying we should build a, a wormhole. And I say, yeah. to where? Or to when? Because if once you do that, you're actually starting to you warp space, you're warping time. Exactly. So that's another aspect of this that, that becomes absolutely difficult, to say the least, to comprehend and wrap your mind around the fact that somebody not only could be traveling through space, but time. We're always doing that in this show. The whole <laughs> multiverse thing is how we what we base our paranormal work on, and yeah. it uh, carries you way beyond what you see on TV usually. Yeah. <coughs> Excuse me. This is really amazing because um, you you got to meet Murray Silver. All, all our our longtime listeners know Murray Silver. He gets into the thing in Washington, and uh, you, you got to get join our little loop here. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Uh, maybe we're loopy, but hey, we have a lot of fun. I, don't know. I, I ask a simple question, and then things just go to hell. Yeah, yeah. Then ask a simple. He asked a simple question about the uh, alleged UFO scene at Obama's inauguration, which looked like a bird, or maybe you could argue it was a skyfish. Holy mackerel! Says, don't get me going on that. Yeah. You know the, the whole the influence of the paranormal in Washington came out. That switchboard lit up, mm-hmm. and it, this is on our South Dakota show. Um, some yeah, it's time radio. Ago. Yeah. But uh, I'll tell you, Ben knows how to ask those questions. <laughs> well, hey, Ben, have you seen the photographs that I've got on my website of the UFOs landing on the Capitol in July 2002? Actually, no. You should check it out. It's at unicusmagazine.com. Just click on books, and then there's a lot of free information there. Um, it's way beyond what CNN accidentally captured. That, to me, actually does look like a bird. Um, but I have got the world's largest collection of... Uh, U- DC UFO movies and photographs wow. and that took me five years and I also have almost 700 700 reports of UFOs and or extraterrestrials in the District of Columbia since 1850 to the present. Again, that took me five years of really hard work to dig that out but it wasn't in some secret vault. It was just sitting there, kind of scattered to the wind and um, you know, well, everybody wants to know, why would they go to D.C.? Well, it's the seat of power. Why wouldn't they go to D.C.? Take me to your leader. Um, either that or they are already having a covert relationship with our le- If you take what I just said for, on face value, that the Poconokit were actually the leaders of a nation here and that they were from Sirius, wh- why would that stop? Why would somebody stop unless there's competition? And, and I think we should back up just a minute because... They, don't, they aren't just coming from Cirrus. There's visitors coming from Orion. There's people coming from the Pleiades. And those are just local 
That's just local stuff. There may be people, if, if stargates are, or wormholes do exist or they can be created, they could be coming from not only distant regions, they could be coming from the past, they could be coming from the future. Um, it's a bit unnerving. And I'll tell you the other thing that, that is very disturbing to people is that these starships have the ability to cloak themselves to our naked eye. And that is very unnerving to think that they could literally be over D.C. or anywhere else and you can't see them. See, this would seem really wild to me, except that from the things we've heard on this show and people we know, people we trust, you know, we hear similar things. Mm -hmm. Uh, Before we get into that any further, I wanted to talk about another incident that I have always found very fascinating that occurred in New England history. And just get get your take on it, okay? It's very little known, but... um, and uh, Ben doesn't even know about this, but this occurred in 1692. And I often wonder, did it contribute to the witchcraft hysteria that began around this area at the same time? Now, this yeah. is on Cape Ann, up north of Boston. And the Salem was a little bit further south, but there, there's uh, uh, the town of Rockport. It's all, to this day, it's very quaint, the North Shore and all of that. And what occurred was that all of a sudden, these people dressed in white started appearing. And 1692 wasn't exactly... You know, people were in villages. They weren't necessarily still in forts. And it was, the, the area was, was beginning to be developed uh, in a recognizable way. And the, the people, the English settlers, assumed that these people were, were French and were, were like French spies or French in, you know, insurgents or something like this working with the natives. But it turns out that they were uh, people who were sort of dressed in white, looked kind of strange. It's about, uh, this is about all Cotton Mather says, Cotton Mather being the great uh, historian and controversial divine of the period writing uh, about uh, New England's development at the time. And these people would would appear in very large groups, would uh, come to the edges of the towns, and being good colonials, they naturally tried to shoot them. All right. <laughs> so they would sometimes chase them away, but they, they could not capture any. They, they, um, when they would be shot on the rare occasions, uh, they would maybe fall over, but they would get up and walk away unharmed. Hmm. And sometimes the bullets or whatever they were using would have no effect whatsoever. There were several kinds of them. Uh, in other words, that's why they thought they were you know, French and, and natives, too. Mm-hmm. And this went on for a period of months. And as and, uh, matter of fact, there was so much firing going on at these people, which had no effect, that they could hear it as far away as Plymouth wow. across the water, which is... Still, it's quite a distance. Right. So and, and they, they began to call these people the League of Specters. And naturally, they figured they were from the devil because they you know, seemed to have very little physical effects on them when they would shoot them. And uh, they didn't seem to do any harm. I mean, at times, they would approach and seem to want to be friends. I mean, somebody like that? Yeah, kind of. Yeah, can you put that on the... Anybody who's uh, listening on the Internet, yeah, there we go. Is right that there, good? On our webcam. Now, what is that exactly? That's me. You. That's me. I was recreating a. Um, I had a, did a photo shoot up in the mountains where the ruins, the megalithic ruins, I found out in Malibu. Um, I, I had an encounter there with a being just like this. Okay. And he said he was my father, which really floored me. Okay, because yeah. I wasn't expecting that at all. But uh, shortly after that is when I, I started finding all the ruins, and yeah. I was given all these artifacts that I was telling you before, and. Uh, <laughs> Be meeting a secret society of the the Shumash Nation out there in California, but um, that's to me these are interdimensional beings. I, I'm glad you brought this up because a lot of times what we're seeing uh, these glowing balls of light uh, coming and going those are not technology; those are actually advanced life forms. I think that's really what our true self looks like when they say we're created in the image of God. I think they're talking about our soul, which is like this luminous egg or sphere of light. Yeah. Yeah, one can go so far as to say is like all the depictions of Jesus are like that. You mean when he's glowing? You mean when he's got the halo or what are you saying? Oh, well, like after he's resurrected, he's like all in Oh yeah, stuff. yeah, Whoosh. it's called the glory, you guys. It's uh mm. it's well, right. that's it what literally it means. And if you look on the on the uh the back of the dollar bill, the Masonic symbol, of the great seal, yeah. you'll see the glory around the all-seeing eye, that radiant light. Mhm. Yes, that's the, you know, the, there's something something that's happened recently, a big breakthrough in science, it's called digital physics, and it talks about that consciousness is primary, and I'll get through this really quick, I know this is going to sound a little boring, but... Um, this is not boring. <laughs> okay, no. well, yeah. to some people, they're like, science... <laughs> um, it, it's What it says is that um, uh, consciousness is digital, meaning that a digit or quanta of, of consciousness 
is it can be any size. It can be massive. It can be the size of the universe, or it could be the size of a, of a t- tiny atom or a quantum. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, even a subatomic uh, digit. Anyway, it can also be on and off. It, it can be processed like any other digit. It can be computed, um, and it's also it's self-referential. It's always communicating with itself. Now, what's interesting about this is a digit of consciousness can be like a digit or a, a, a um, atom of water. It can take three phase states. Three phase states. Oh, you're on my website. Okay. So um, uh, it's either, water, as you know, can be a solid, a liquid, or gas. Consciousness, as it turns out, can be either pure consciousness, energy, or matter. And that's a huge breakthrough. It may sound simple what I just said, but if you really think about that, if we were to accept that as a fact and work forward from that point, our science would change, our way of life would change, we would change, and we will change. We will become more advanced. We will evolve. In fact, the whole this whole virtual reality we're in right now is set up so that our consciousness can evolve. We evolve the the, the collective evolves individually and collectively at the same time. So. As the Masons say, out of chaos comes order. Each simulation, when it's first begun, is chaotic, and the consciousness is very scattered. But over time, it becomes more orderly and orderly and orderly because it's being computed, it's being processed. Every event, every uh, experience is being processed. So we actually have a much larger role to play than we think, but it's not for the reasons that we think. That's very well put. You have have laid out uh, some amazing brushstrokes here. All I can say is that in 40 years of paranormal research, I have come to very, very similar conclusions. Mm. Simply by being out in the trenches and seeing, j- just working with ghosts, quote unquote. Mm-hmm. You know, I very quickly came to the conclusion, and Ben works with me now too, of course, for the past five years. Like these aren't spirits, you know, dead people. I mean, this is right. a whole a whole different level. And for the paranormal uh, is now research, even pop paranormal research is starting to realize this. They're getting bored with running around, you know, running away from chairs that move and stuff. <laughs> yeah, that's and, silly. You know, all this nonsense. And we're getting into the next level, which has to do with human consciousness and where we're going and what we're becoming. Well, well Paul, the natives, set call, we called that what the natives belief was that animism, that everything had a, a, a spirit or consciousness. And it turns out, this is true. My, my Osamaguan friend from the Poconoket tribes uh, explained to me that we exist within the mind of God. And when I explained to him why that statement was true, he nearly fell out of his chair. Because most people dismiss that as just being uh, silliness. But I, I not only recognized it, I honored what he said and I took it one step further and said, okay, you're right and here's why you're right. Mm-hmm. And I explained digital physics to him. Okay, now these are just terms, but once we recognize that everything is consciousness and we start acting more you know interacting with it on that level that's that's when all kinds of be, uh, what you call it we call it paranormal uh, or occult it's it's not really hidden and it's not beyond the norm it's just a different level of reality that's well, as all. we say it's all part of nature yeah. well the Native Americans say that we're all related and we are because we were all created by the same thing, the same source, the same creator, the the, the grand architect of the universe. So, um, you know, by degrees we all evolve, but collectively something's going to happen. From what I understand, I know a lot of people have theories about 2012, yeah. but but there is a cycle of events that happen. Uh, uh, you know, c- consciousness has to evolve. That's the okay. that's the primary reason it exists. So. There's going to be a shift in consciousness, a drastic shift in consciousness, and that's coming soon. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Very good. Excellent. We're, we're going to leave it there for a commercial break. We're going to be right back on Behind the Paranormal with Robert Stanley and our fascinating conversation about everything. Stay with us. New River Press is proud to sponsor tonight's segment of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Benjamin Eno. New River Press offers the best in unusual New Age books. Stand by the side of tonight's host, Paul Eno, as he battles poltergeists and helps suffering souls and families in the critically acclaimed books, Faces at the Window and Footsteps in the Attic. Plunge deeper into the paranormal with Paul and learn about his influence on human history, its action in our daily lives, and its ultimate meaning for us in the best-selling Turning Home, God, Ghosts, and Human Destiny. 
Available now from New River Press, publishers of unusual books. Visit NewRiverPress.com, Amazon.com, or your favorite bookstore. And set for release late this year in one of the most unusual books on the subject ever written, Paul gives us Dancing Past the Graveyard, What Ghosts Have to Say About God. We can, we'll get to this. Okay, we are back behind the paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno and our very special guest today, Robert Stanley, who was explaining uh, just about everything when it comes to human consciousness as the Native Americans experienced it and, and, and understand it and can explain it to us. And why don't you just stuff. continue where you left off, uh, Robert? Uh, okay, um, you know, I think, I, yeah, I tend to wander on these on this subject, but I, I just, there's something I wanted to back uh, go back to as far as artifacts. I let a lot of people wonder... Uh, do you believe in UFOs? And my answer is no. Uh, and I don't believe in Santa Claus either. I, I, sure. I, I study UFOs. I research them. I've experienced close encounters with what appear to be alien starships and, and um, star people. You know, So that's why I'm interested in this thing. That's why I keep pushing to – because I know there's more information out there that's been hidden. Or that we have ignored. I mean, it's it's kind of a combination of both. Clearly, there's an agenda going on here. Some people feel that um, we're more easily controlled if we're ignorant. I really uh, think yeah, we can argue that very yeah. easily. Uh, well, the same. This, okay, I hate this analogy, but I'm going to give it anyways. Is when 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 the uh, the African slaves were brought here, it was actually illegal for anyone to educate them. And you would be punished or put to death if you did that. And the reason being is because w- the, the slave owners knew that once they became educated, and start, they would become competitive and, and ha- much harder to control. And I really think that over the years what I've learned is that there is good and bad everywhere, and that would have to include the ETs, that, that some of them really don't have our best interests at heart. Um, I agree with that. Well, yeah. you know, because they're, they're either, you know, for whatever reason, they're basically manipulative and... Um, the empirical. They want to establish an empire, and they do it with an iron fist. It's not. It's not democratic. It's not a republic. It's, you know. So what's going on here with this experiment, the, the great experiment of our us being free, somewhat, uh, within a, a nation of laws, is 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 phenomenal. But at the same time, we're always having to fight to maintain our freedom, and to learn more how to how to. You know, keep our evolution going as opposed to being you know controlled and suppressed. You know what that reminds me of. Hmm. This may be weird, but it reminds me of the X Files, like Wicked Bad, because that's like the whole that's the whole premise of it. Like FEMA is like controlling everybody because they're like the secret government, and yeah. it's it just sounds exactly like that. I'm just like this is awesome. Well, one of my mentors is a Mason, and he's on the inner circle. You might find this interesting. And he, I, at some point in my research, I said to him, I didn't even know he was a Mason. I've known the guy for ten years, and I said to him. Um, I think I found graphic evidence that uh, Masons are actually in contact with extraterrestrials. He says they are. And I said, what do you mean? He goes, oh, didn't I tell you I'm a Mason? And I said, no, but thanks. I mean, you know, uh, <laughs> surprise. And um, so I said, well, you know, I, I knew he, he, even though he worked in the government and, you know, aerospace engineering and whatnot, uh, it was a little bit surprising for him to admit to me that there was some relationship going on covertly uh, specifically in D.C., but obviously elsewhere. And um, it made me wonder, like I have been wondering for years, why all the secrecy? And um, he recently said something to me was that um, the public really isn't ready for this. And I think even when the when the Poconokit were um, r- the rulers, established rulers of the Wampanoag, I don't think they explained everything that they knew or did to the average person. To their own people. Right. Well, yeah. because they were protecting and guiding the Wampanoag Nation. And I, you don't always... I think there's a saying in... I, I, again, I'm going to probably offend somebody. There's a saying in the Bible that you don't cast your pearls of wisdom before swine because they'll trample it in the mud of ignorance. But certain information is so valuable and so important that you don't... Like the game of telephone, you know, if you tell somebody, they will go tell somebody else and pretty soon it's diluted and twisted. And uh, Especially if you're dealing with an oral tradition of history... You cannot just give things that are super important to you, to the survival of a people. You can't just give it out to the public because they will either dismiss it or distort it. And so um, that helped me understand a little more of why there is, is le- compartmentalization mm. and levels of secrecy. I'm not saying it can't be abused. I'm just saying that that's why it exists, in my, in my opinion now. There's a reason for it, and it actually serves a purpose. 
Well, again, if, if, if we hadn't seen the things we've seen, particularly me in, in all these years, yeah. you know, I, I would, you know, wonder if I shouldn't call the men in the white coats. But, you know, but, but, but your, your experience is very, very similar to what I've encountered in dealing with other Native Americans. You've had more contact than I have, but I've dealt with the Aborigines in Australia and the Cree mm. and also the Mohawk. Wow. And I've heard, I've heard very, very similar stories, very, very similar points of view. Now, the thing is, how do we define an extraterrestrial because we, we you know in our ghost work we run into things you know I don't believe the classical thing at all but there there are all sorts of interesting people and beings from all sorts of different worlds especially I'm thinking of that one house in Connecticut where we're going to be doing our TV pilot and then that's going to be uh, in the, the central Connecticut area We've got very tall beings. Like running, you got the horses galloping down the hallway. You got, uh, you know, very in, unimaginably weird creatures bouncing around outside the windows. You got UFOs, black helicopters. You name it, <laughs> it's there because we think it's a crossroads of the multiverse. Yeah, you get all kinds of different worlds coming together because of the energies and in, 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 on the site. It's it's really quite unique. So um, we hear you. You know, this stuff is, is out there, you know, as far as exactly how you define it, or how you, what you'd call an extraterrestrial might be a question, because mm-hmm. some of these are probably just from parallel worlds, you know, and because the whole notion of extraterrestrial takes on, you know, multidimensional meanings. Well, especially if they have bases here, and I think that's been pretty well established that under the ocean, inside mountains, possibly even orbiting n- near Earth, that, that extraterrestrials or, or you know, space tra- star I like the star people. I think that it's probably a very good description. Mm-hmm. Like, UFO is a really misleading term. It's like, you, you think, what, it has no identity? Yeah, that's what Stan Friedman says. It, it's silly. It's absolutely, it's in, it, again, these, there's a lot of mind games being played here, but um, uh, are, are we all related? Are we all connected? Yes. Is it multiple dimensional? Sure, because it's a fractal. This is a holographic fractal, Makes and you sense. have sets within subsets, etc. And like I'm saying, if you really want to move to really be able to uh, uh, break down the barriers and start to move within this uh, hologram matrix thing that we're in, uh, <laughs> we have to start recognizing that our consciousness is the key. That's the only way we can unlock these things, and that's that's it. That has to be earned by degrees for a reason. You cannot just jump ahead. You would freak out. You would overload. You wouldn't, and you would have no context. Mm-hmm. You have no context whatsoever, and it would probably scare you or or worse. Uh, ben, do you have any further questions before I ask my next? Um, no, I'm not gonna get into because then like the weird things will start happening. So, <laughs> yes, continue. <laughs> you wouldn't believe some of the stuff that happens to us. We talk about this, no, so, especially I, with Murray. I would. I would. Murray, Murray doesn't care. What he says, you know. Yeah. Well, he does because he told us to take that thing off. Well, that's true. Yeah, he was he was being leaned on by very high up in the government, and we had to take the podcast out. Uh, well, you but. know, I understand because once I started investigating Washington D.C., that's when I got my first visit from a black helicopter, and then when I did my first international radio interview, or, I mean, excuse me, uh, national radio interview about it, I got my website was hacked. The server was literally hacked, and the yeah. guys that owned the server couldn't even get in there and fix it for me. Actually, I know someone that happened to my friend, one of my close friends. I haven't talked to him in a while because he just joined the Army Reserves. He had a he had a website about UFOs and the government mixing with them, and it was a locked site. Nobody else had passwords to like mess with the website, and there were all these warnings and stuff on his site that appeared the next day, and it was just like, do not believe this. This is all fake. This is all whatever. You, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, there's a backdoor in everybody's computer. They don't want to admit admit it, but uh, that's you know that's a whole other story. Yeah. Well, one of the things that got us interested in you was you contacted us, right? And you sent a very, very interesting. I don't, did you? I don't know if you heard there were one or two shows, including on this station, that I mentioned my, if you want to call it a sighting over Providence, uh, several months ago. Okay. Mm. Oh and, yeah, yeah. It was yeah. exactly like the picture I took yeah, yeah, that's, last that's year. What, yeah, you sent a photo. I said, you know, I, I would, as one who has some professional photographic experience, I would have said. Yeah, I have a few questions about this, but if it had not been exactly what I saw with the naked eye. Right. You know, and I'm not, I don't usually see, you know, UFOs and stuff, but this particular time, as I said, I was just going across the new bridge over mm-hmm. the upper part of Narragansett Bay there, and, mm-hmm. and uh, there's the thing in the sky, perfectly clear sky, and um, there was a, a, a cloudy sort of undulation kind of thing, like as we'd see in multiverse mm-hmm. things that we encounter. And there was a star, and it moved a little bit to the left. It didn't look like a craft, and then it just sat there. Yeah. And I said, okay. So by that time, I was on 95 North, and I was out of sight of the thing. 
And I said, wow. And I asked her there, if anybody else has seen this, I'd love to hear about it. And we, then, then you, uh, shortly, you know, shortly after that, I got the picture that you sent. Yeah, and I took that of February 19th of 2009, last year, at 10 o'clock in the morning on a clear blue sky day. And the, the weirdest part about the whole thing was the night before I'd done a radio interview, and I walked out after the interview. I was very frustrated. I walked out, and I looked up at the stars, and I said, hey, you guys, uh, I could use a little help. And I really didn't expect anything to happen. I was just really venting some frustration. The very next morning, this craft or entity showed up, and it literally passed through the TF Green uh, flight zone. It was really bizarre. I'm out there with the dog, and I see this jet, which was unusually low. I I think, in a way, I kind of think that they dipped down as they were taking off. They dipped down, and they went right by it. And it crossed over the flight path, went parked over the house. I ran in the house. I got my Nikon camera with a 200-millimeter zoom, and I'm snapping pictures of it. And I look down to check my settings. I look back up, and it was gone. I mean, believe me, if it had moved, I would have seen it because it, it was a clear blue day. What's really strange is that what I saw with my naked eye was a very golden uh, colored object, and what the camera picked up was the energy field around it. So when I took the camera, then. Uh, yeah, but yeah. I've got a high-end Nikon, okay? I mean, yeah. it's like it's not a point-and-shoot. Okay? All my stuff is done manually, and uh, I process it myself, and, you know, I, I do know something about photography. So, oh, yeah. uh, anyway, the thing, what I had to do was reduce the contrast and the brightness in order to actually see the object through the energy field. And this is what I was trying to say before. The energy field usually registers in a spectrum beyond our vision, because if this is the radio frequency or, the, you know, the electromagnetic frequency, we only see this much. On a good day, mm-hmm. you know, some people are a little more attuned, they, you know. But uh, so, and cameras, even if they're not film, will pick up more radiation than uh, our eyes do. So that's what was going on there. But it, it, why is this important? Is because it, they, someone came down and responded to my mental call for help. And it's like, you know, like I said, I wasn't expecting help, but they were showing, they were demonstrating that they heard. And in some ways it was helpful. It was, it was reassuring that, to know that they actually heard me and that they did care enough to come down and park over the house for a minute. Or actually it was about five minutes they were, that I, you know, we had this thing going All on. All right. Well, let, let, let's get to the, to the bottom line here. Okay. Right? What... Is wh- wh- where are we in? The, assuming all this is true, yes. Where are we in the pecking order here? If the, you, you mentioned somebody's trying to build an empire. Why don't they just come in and conquer the place? I mean, oh is, boy. Or, or is our consciousness important to the the matrix, the system? I mean, wh- what what is actually going on here? Who are these people? How many different kinds are there? Are they at, at war with each other? Mm-hmm. Some of them seem to be. Uh, at odd, I, I mean, what is going on? Oh, you asked a lot of good questions there. Um, Okay, so they don't tell us because, yes, like the Matrix, uh, it, if you remember that one encounter scene where Neo speaks to the architect and he says yeah. there's been many Matrixes. And I didn't see that. Oh, you don't remember? Yeah. Well, anyway, he tells Neo. It. He says the movie was. Okay, so he says to, to Neo, you're not the first anomaly. This is not the first Matrix. There was one Matrix where we told everybody what was going on and they became totally apathetic. They would not function. They would not generate energy yeah. for us, so we had to scrap it and start over and basically you know, create this veil. So in some regards, it works a lot better for the elite rulers to remain in the dark and give us the sense of freedom and autonomy. And is there a war in the heavens? Absolutely. Um, my understanding is that our, our original ancestors came from the system of Lyra. They destroyed the entire solar system. If you look at it now, the picture, they call it the Eye of God. It's actually a huge uh, thermonuclear explosion. Really? Uh, yeah, and it just blew up the base. Th- what I'm told is they blew up the entire solar system. Some people survived. They migrated different directions. They went to the Pleiades. Time traveled to the Pleiades in the future. They went to Cirrus. They went to Orion and probably a few other places. And then eventually they they came here. But this, you know, this is what people do they establish power bases they uh, create empires and i really think that at some point all of this will come out but only when it serves the agenda of the elite and at that point um everything will change everything is going to change okay we'll get to that in a minute but how we seem to be attributing a lot of human characteristics the in theology they call it anthropomorphism yes and uh we're here. We're here. We got. We got a contest question about this three-legged creature in Illinois. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, how human are these guys? Some of them are completely human, 
And it's a good thing that you brought that up. In my uh, chapter two of my book, I, re- I interviewed in depth a retired command sergeant major from NATO. He, he, I mean, he worked for our U.S. Army, but he was actually had a cosmic top secret clearance, so he says, uh, for NATO. And, it, and in the early 60s, he read something called the assessment, the threat assessment of UFOs and their occupants. Uh, NATO was really concerned because they did that during the Cold War, some of these UFOs coming in over the po- uh, polar cap actually looked like missiles being fired from Russia. And it caused the level of readiness to just jump, you know. And then they, they, they wanted to understand, is, are these guys really a threat? Or are they trying to trigger a war or whatever? So the assessment back in the early 60s came to the conclusion that uh, there was four different races of beings visiting us frequently. One of them was the tall, bald-headed gray types. The, the other one was a smaller, gr- uh, bald-headed gray type of humanoid. Uh, there was a reptilian humanoids. And then there was the human, perfectly human Humanoids that were coming here on a regular basis, and of those four group, they they said none of these seem to be an overt threat to us, but they what really bothered them was this group that looks completely human, because they said uh, they could be anywhere. They could be in NATO. They could be in the Pentagon. They could be in the White House. That's really trippy. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, the thing is, you know, is if we hadn't seen what we've seen, you know, realize that anything is possible and probable. <laughs> yep. Even, you know, it's uh, it's it's way out way out stuff. Oh, any more questions, Ben? Because uh, I have one or two. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, we're going to have to try and do this again sometime. We sure yeah, are. Yeah, yeah. Well, we got a few more minutes before. Okay. We get, good. Uh, okay. Now, let's just kind of get back to the, to the Native Americans. Sure. Okay. Um, I, I see your point about them dealing with the leadership. Mm-hmm. Okay, but it seems as though the Native Americans know a lot more than we do. I mean, you, you, when I was dealing with the, the Aboriginal um, elder, with the Cree shaman, and these people, you know, spiritually speaking, even intellectually, are, are so you know light years above us. I mean, we're, we're like kids in the sandbox. And, and that's by choice because of the kind of society we have. You know, that was but, that was actually put upon us. In my estimation of what you're describing we there. We were dumbed down deliberately. Yeah, there was a point in in the recent past where all tribal way of living ceased because there was a concerted effort to put a control mechanism on top of us as a, as a people here, a mix of different races that came to this world, this garden. And, you know, somebody wanted to control this as part of their empire, and they did it deliberately. They cut us off. Now, some of us, I think, in this room are actually more recent arrivals genetically than the, what we might call a more aboriginal people. So they have a memory of the star people coming, interacting, whatever, whereas we have been completely, like I said before, we're basically being treated like the slaves that we brought from Africa. We're, we are not being educated. We're cut off from our true history. We're fed a bunch of nonsense about, you know, we are originated from apes and, you know, we slowly evolved. And, uh, you know, it, it, as far as Columbus discovering America, please... Who do you think was living here? Of course, yeah. you know. I no, he didn't. Dis- he discovered it was already discovered. I mean, this, this is this is the, the, the sad truth about it. Is and and even the Native Americans talk about different people. Like you look in uh, Washington State with the Kennewick man. Uh, it's very controversial, but he was clearly not genetically related to any of the people that lived there. He traveled from somewhere, and it was way before the Europeans arrived. Yeah, well, world trade seems to have been. You know, Absolutely. Thousands of years. You know, Absolutely. In effect, and we seem surprised by it because we're so arrogant. So uh, we, I, I, I have a quick question. Cool. So do you think like consumerism was like consumerism, things like that, like capitalism, all these different forms of politics are just pretty much inform like pushed onto us mm-hmm. so that we're easily controlled, to, like just keep us confused and keep all us that. Fat, dumb, and happy. Um, and also divided against each other. Well, that's for sure. Unfortunately, I, I, I feel very bad about that, but that's it's a system that works very well, divide and conquer, a class system. And, and you know, we're, we're divided. I mean, if you think about it, every time you say, I am this, well, then you're not that. There's another wall that's erected. It's a yeah. firewall between the levels of consciousness. Like I said, Native Americans acknowledged and lived the fact that we were all related, all of us, and everything was all existing together, and communicating, and there there wasn't all these barriers. The divisions just didn't exist. So in some ways, yeah, they may have not had the level of technology, but as far as awareness, they yes, I think they are 
in many ways more advanced than us. All right. Well, l- let's get back. We started talking about twenty. You, you mentioned twenty twelve. Yeah. So I think that's a good way to wrap things okay. up. Okay. What, what's what's your take on twenty twelve? And where's all is this all this going to the Omega point in twenty twelve, so to speak? Where's it all going? And what's twenty twelve got to do with it? Uh, it's a it's a long period cycle that apparently happens periodically. Uh, some people say it's going to be death and destruction. I I don't know. There's been a lot of uh, cataclysmic events on but but life continues and in fact it continues to evolve and it's very diverse so uh, what my my friend here the the Poconocet Osamegwin told me recently was that we will move deeper into our subconscious and as we do that as a species here on this world that <clears throat> the barriers will start to break down <clears throat> the control mechanisms will simply not work anymore and we will recognize each other as all one family. And, we'll, and we will start to be able to communicate with these other beings that are extended family from beyond this world. And at that point, all the deception has to come to a screeching halt. Then we have to decide how do we want to proceed. Do we want to go back to living a tribal life that includes communication with these, these extended family or not? I think we will. I really think we will. However, we might have to trade in all our technology and our dollar bills and our fancy cars and stuff in order to achieve that, but it may, it may be worth it. So that's something that we're going to be facing here in the near future. You know, I can't speak for Ben, of course, but this this is something that, that rings true for in my whole experience. And yeah, that, me that too. We, yeah, and that we, we seem to be working for inadvertently just in the paranormal work by discovering what the real relationships are among paranormal phenomena, which are not paranormal at all. They're entirely normal. Yeah. And the subconscious, you know, where all the roads are between our different lives mm-hmm. and all, you know, and the, everything seems to connect through the paranormal. And, and as it comes together, what you describe is exactly what we see happening. Hmm. Yeah. You know, and, and it's uh, it sounds you know maudlin sometimes or sappy, you know, but, and believe me, I'm not the, I'm the unsappiest guy around. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I you know I just this is love is where it is shared life shared consciousness. I mean this is it. And uh, if if that's happening, then bravo. Uh, I, I did want to ask you too. We're coming down to the end of the hour here, yeah. but. We have a lot of guests who talk about UFOs mm. and ETs and things, and many, particularly the group in Phoenix, who we love dearly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, as, as I say, they like float above the mic, and you know, they say, oh, <laughs> they're going to all save us, and the, the, the Phoenix lights, which I've seen myself, mm-hmm. are uh, uh, you know uh, signs like of our salvation. Key, things like that. Yeah, other people, yeah, you were on the wrong side of the plane. You didn't see. Yeah. The, other people will say, you know, we, we've got some serious opponents here. Mm-hmm. It's all lies. And we're, we're, we're just like the X Files. Just like the X Files. Oh yeah, my God. Yeah. Okay. Well, all right. Well, you know more about that than I do. Yes. But this is what people are saying. What say you? I, I think it's wrong to be polarized about. It's it's not either or. It's both. I described to you that there are good, benevolent extraterrestrials, and that there are fallen angels or extraterrestrial demons, whatever you want to call them, among us. Yeah. Are they here controlling? Some of them clearly are. Is there a conflict? Yes, clearly there is. Are we ignoring it as a species? Yes, but that can come to an end at some point. Once we wake up, once we graduate, that will end, and we can move on to the next next level. Okay, excellent. Well, you, you maybe use different words now and then, but you sure describe our experience. Yeah. Rob, tell us about your book. Okay, Close Encounters on Capitol Hill. It's only available on my website, which is unicusmagazine.com. Just click on books. There's a lot of free information there, too, just to get your feet wet. Uh, you know, But the book itself is, is phenomenal. I'm coming out with the second one, uh, Close Encounters in Washington, D.C., just kind of wrap up my five-year investigation. Uh, uh, you know, Love to hear if anybody out there uh, has any more pieces of that puzzle, because I know you're out there. I know people are sitting on this information because they're scared to come forward, but don't be. I'm telling you, this story has got to come forward. We need to know the true history of Washington, D.C. All right. Excellent. And and now what else are you working on uh, coming up? Uh, Well, aligned with this topic, uh, my third book will be, uh, you know, Mystic America, The Hidden History of Turtle Island. And I'm going to just lay all the stuff out that I've learned from West Coast to East Coast and bring it all into some kind of uh, uh, summary form. Uh, and, and again, I think to just kind of give people orientation of how we got here and where we might be headed. Mm-hmm. 
so. Excellent. Okay, well, I, I, I think I can safely say you're going to be a good friend and uh, a frequent guest. Yeah. Uh, just, you Thanks, know, guys. We, we like you a lot, and I... Thank you. You know, crazy as it makes sound to some people, <laughs> but this seems to be what's going on or something yes. like it anyway. Yes. All right. Well, we're, we're coming down to the end of our hour here. And uh, I wanted to just remind everybody, of course, check our website, BehindTheParanormal.com. And we do have a couple of emails we did not get to, but we will next time. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> interesting. We, we just never so got yeah, Absolutely. Yeah, we just get carried away. And, of course, um, as Ben would say, more show info. Subscribe to our newsletter. Oh, yes. And on our regular show tomorrow at 7 p.m. Eastern, 4 Pacific, on CBS News Guy Radio and www.newsguyradio.com, we'll welcome an old friend uh, on a rather new paranormal topic, the latest development in the realm of the 2012 Doomsday Prophecies. And D. Erlon assures us that there are some new developments. Yes, the airline is a novelist, but he is a real expert on this subject, and uh, 2012 coming up today is very appropriate. And he, uh, he also has, has contacts with astronomers who tell him things they don't generally announce to the public. So, hmm. uh, And, and we, we know him very well, and I, I know that he's uh, legit on that. So. All right, so che- and also check out our show website, www.behindtheparanormal.com, and our local radio schedules for... The cities where CBS carrier carries our show, and the new websites where you can hear us from anywhere. And remember, you can always get free podcasts of all our shows along with show schedules and guest information at www.behindtheparanormal.com. Okay, so many thanks to our sainted producer, the great Craig Pelletier. And we'll see you next Saturday, okay, May 22nd on onworldwide.com and WON 1240 AM. In New England's beautiful Blackstone River Valley, and we will welcome paranormal expert and author R. Neville Johnston for a discussion on hidden language codes. And uh, let me, before we end, uh, let me just remind people, too, that we have changed the date of our famous Rendlesham show. This is the 30th anniversary of the Rendlesham Forest uh, UFO incidents, and we had a very successful show on April 11th on CBS with Colonel Halt and... uh, Larry Warren and several of the witnesses, who had, uh, some of whom had never appeared together live. And uh, also with Bill Burns of UFO Hunters, uh, Nick Pope uh, was on pre recorded with a yeah. former official of the British Ministry of Defense, and all sorts of real headliners on that case. And we were going to be doing a series that was, we, had, uh, we reportedly had over 3 million listeners, and we're going to be doing several more shows leading up to the December uh, event of the um, anniversary. And uh, so we. It's, we have changed the next show from June 6th to June 20th on uh, our CBS combined show with Behind the Paranormal and Caps Paranormal. Uh, and again, check our website where you can pick that up. We're all over the Internet, and we're in Seattle, Detroit, and Boston. We're well, everywhere. Well, almost everywhere. We're getting there. So anyway, in the meantime, we're going to leave you with a little quote. All right, from St. Julian of Norwich. In the end, all will be well. Nice and simple. I think that, <laughs> along with my other favorite quote, Everything you know is wrong. Yeah, that's, uh, that's how we're going to leave you today. And we thank again our wonderful guest. Thanks. Stan. Thank you. Thank you for having me, guys. Very good. Oh, it was we'll talking again soon. Okay. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.